Well, if you've been reading your way through Isaiah, which I don't expect that you have been, but most people, when they get to a passage in the Bible, at least at the time it was written, they've been working their way through. But if you may recall chapter 39, a very big change happens in chapter 40 from what we've had in chapter 39. And so we'll go back to, oh, several hundred years before Jesus was born, around 700 years or so, uh, maybe slightly less than that, before Jesus was born. King Hezekiah was king in Jerusalem, and he had been very, very ill, and then he had recovered miraculously, and he was very excited about this because he didn't think he was going to live. And then the nations around uh, Israel, well, Judea is where he was the king, the nations around Judea heard that he had recovered, and so they sent people uh, to say congratulations and so happy that you got well. And among them was this group of people from this far-off nation called Babylon. Today it's Iraq. But far-off nation called Babylon. King Hezekiah was not a great student of geography. He didn't really know much about Babylon. But he was happy that these people came with letters and with a gift. And so what did he do? He showed them around. Showed them around Jerusalem. Isn't this wonderful? Took them to the armory. Showed them all the weapons that he had. Took them to his treasury. Showed him everything that was in there. And the prophet Isaiah came to him and said, what did they see in your palace? And he said, I showed them everything. Every beautiful thing in the treasury, I showed them. And Isaiah doesn't come out exactly and say it. But what he wants to say is, well, I hope you enjoyed that because they're going to take every one of those things away. And eventually they would. Uh, Babylon besieges Jerusalem in 586 B.C. The city falls, all of Judea falls, and everything that Hezekiah showed them that hadn't already been lost was carted off to Babylon. So that's what we know going into it. That's chapter 39. But for Isaiah, he realizes this is the disaster that's going to come on the people, that they are going to be judged for turning away from God, just as God had promised. And as they had agreed in the first covenant uh, that they made, well, not the first, but the first covenant between God and his people back in the time of Moses, um, to, to know that if they followed God, God would bless them and take care of them. If they continued to reject God and turn away from God, then consequences would happen. That's your setting. That's the context. The people have, generation after generation, turned away from the Lord. And if they read their Bible, they would know bad things are going to happen and now the, the, mission, the, the mission from Babylon, the ambassadors from Babylon have shown up, and that's the foreshadowing. So at the time that Isaiah is writing, the people are going to be carted off into exile. But he's going to remind them of another time, that they were enslaved, they were captured, they were not free people, and God delivered them. And by reminding them of that time, then he's going to point ahead to what God's going to do in the future. I think Isaiah works like this an awful lot. Uh, he addresses what's going on now. He looks back to see what God has done in the past and then can say, so therefore, this is what God's going to do in the future. Or at least he'll say, this is what God's going to do, going to do in the future. How do we know? This is what he's done before. So for a people who are going to feel God's judgment, who are going to feel like God is upset with them, angry with them, uh, going to feel the consequences of their sin, this is the word that Isaiah speaks. Comfort. Comfort, my people, says your God. The God who made them, created them in his own image, made them his own people, and now will save them. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she is received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. This is a word of hope that will eventually reach the people when they're in exile. So when they realize they've rejected God, when they have suffered the consequences of that, been taken far, far away to this foreign land where they don't know anybody, they don't know the language, they worship weird gods there, this is the message that will ring out to them. Her hard service has been completed, her sin paid for, she'd received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A message of restoration, of renewal, of hope for people who felt like they were in a very dark place at a very dark time and wondered, has God forgotten us entirely? Or as the psalmist often cry out, Lord, will you be angry with us forever? Here comes this word. Comfort my people, speak tenderly, and proclaim to her her hard service is completed. And basically, the vision then is that he will bring his people back from exile. A voice of one calling, In the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Well, this is an incredibly profound image for the people of Israel. Because they know what it's like to live near wildernesses and deserts, and they know in their history what it means for their people to have gone through the wilderness, to have gone through the desert. So this is where Isaiah is looking back. 
So the message of hope is going to derive from God's character and actions in the past, knowing that God will be the same way now and God will be the same way in the future. So several hundred years before the people go into exile, this same people, their ancestors, are wandering in the wilderness. And that ought to have been a good thing because they once were slaves in Egypt. God brought them out through the Red Sea. They walked through on dry land, and now they're wandering through the wilderness. But that was a difficult time. It was a place where the people experienced both judgment but also repentance and renewal. And both of those images are in play here, I think. An image of judgment because they didn't trust in God, but also an image of repentance and renewal and when they saw God at work in powerful ways. Well, that's basically the story of the book of Exodus, right? They get out of Egypt. Well, first we have to realize why they're there. Then we get out of Egypt and we wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And wouldn't they have liked in the wilderness a straight road to walk on? Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. If you read through Exodus and and, uh, Leviticus and Numbers, Judges a little bit too, and Joshua, I guess, a little bit too, not Judges, the people occasionally get to walk on a road when they're making their way into the promised land. But as soon as they get to the uh, a nice road they can walk on, whatever nation owns that road kicks them off of it, and they have to wander around away. They haven't had a straight path through the wilderness, but this is the promise of Isaiah. Not wandering all over the place, wondering will we ever get there, but a straight uh, path and a highway for our God. Even at the time of the prophet Hosea, the people were reminded that the wilderness was not all bad, a little bit frightening perhaps. And again, at the time of Exodus, what did the people experience? They ran out of food. What are we going to do for food? Manna comes from heaven and they are fed. They get sick of manna, they like a little meat, and they get more meat than they can possibly eat, quail come. They run out of water and they think Lord is, the Lord is going to make us die of thirst here out in the desert. And water comes from a rock. So they grumble against God. And they experience some of God's judgment, but also in the desert, in the wilderness, they experience these grand miracles of God's provision. You need food, I will make food drop out of heaven for you. You need water, see that rock? Here is water for you from the rock. So even in Hosea, much, much, much later, um, they're reminded that the desert is a place where God provides and the desert is a place where God uh, renews God's people. Well... To look ahead, so from the Exodus, time of Isaiah, and then to look ahead, John the Baptist shows up. And where does he go? He doesn't go into Jerusalem and preach there. He doesn't preach in the temple courts. He goes out beyond the Jordan River in the wilderness, in the desert, to call God's people back into the wilderness so that then they can enter into the promised land when Jesus shows up. He goes into the wilderness as a place of repentance and renewal. And there people come and they're baptized, confessing their sins, and they are made ready for the kingdom of God to show up. Isaiah's vision of the kingdom of God and of God himself showing up is this. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level and the rugged places a plain. Every obstacle, every difficulty, every uh, annoyance of the journey through the wilderness. We're going up, we're going down. It's winding around. We can't go straight. We have to climb hills or we drop into the valley. And that's not encouraging because if you drop into the valley, you've got to climb back out of it again. Isaiah says, says God is going to smooth everything out and it will be flat and it will be easy going and the highway will be straight and when God shows up we get to accompany God on this highway into the promised land. To the people that Isaiah is speaking to this is clearly a second exodus. You who are off in Babylon in exile in captivity will be brought back by this straight way and this smooth and level way and God himself will accompany you back to your land. At the time of John the Baptist, he is expecting God to show up and for all time to end and everything to change and the day of the Lord to show up. And he goes into the wilderness knowing that we need another exodus. We need an exodus uh, not from Egypt into the promised land and not from Babylon back into Palestine. We need an exodus from death and being captive to sin into freedom and into life. And he is also expecting the wilderness utterly to be changed. And what does he do? John the Baptist's whole mission was never about himself, but always to point ahead to somebody else. So John the Baptist is out there, and he's preaching, and he's baptizing, and suddenly Jesus shows up, and John the Baptist gets to point him out and say, this is the one. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God has shown up in the flesh. Isaiah says, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And that was John's whole point. 
to show. This is the one in whom all the glory of God dwells, the one who is full of grace and truth, the word of God made flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, dwelling among us, pitching his tent among us. That's really the word he uses for dwelling among us. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together shall see it. Well, that didn't exactly happen, did it? Because Isaiah, unknowing to him, unbelievably, he must have been so excited when he got to be with the Lord and realized that his words, which for him were words that the people needed to hear when they were in exile, rolled down through the ages, were words of comfort for a people in captivity, and then sustained the people hundreds of more years until Jesus shows up. And then when Jesus does show up, behold the Lamb of God, we find that this vision has still not been fully revealed, fully completed. Which is why last week I reminded you of, of when Peter in his, in his second epistle talks about with the day, well, first he says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. That's a good reminder. And he says, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. But do not lose heart. God will keep his promises and Jesus will come again. And when he does, no one can miss it. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind together will see it. All the world will know that this is the King of kings and Lord of lords. How do we know? For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. We'll talk about the mouth of the Lord in a moment. So a people in exile, comfort and mercy and tenderness is extended. You who are far, far away are going to be brought home. To the people at the time of John the Baptist and Jesus, remember that they were still an occupied nation. This just seemed to happen to them over and over again. So for the kingdom to the north in the 700s BC, Assyria came in and took the people away. And then in the 5th and 6th century, I'm not good with 6th centuries BC, but 500s, 600s BC, it's going the wrong way, right? 500s, 600s BC, Babylon comes and it conquers Jerusalem, carries the people off into exile. You think that'd be enough? No. Babylon is conquered by Persia. Persia is conquered by Greece. And Greece is finally conquered by the Roman Empire. We get to Jesus and now we're still occupied. There's still this foreign army invading us and it's the Roman Empire. And to people who are still occupied, for people who are wondering, will God speak to us again? They hadn't had a writing prophet in 400 years. John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And it doesn't stop then. Down through the ages, down through the ages still, for people who find themselves in darkness, who find themselves lost, who find themselves in captivity to sin and to death, still comfort, comfort, and good news is preached because the glory of the Lord will be revealed. For Isaiah, God's glory is revealed when he delivers his people out of captivity and brings them back to the land has no idea that God's going to use these same words to talk about one who will come and deliver his people from captivity to sin and death and bring them into freedom and to life in relationship with himself. A voice says, cry out. That's God saying, cry out. And so Isaiah answers, what shall I cry? And then this strange passage, which is full of hope, but you don't see it right at first. One of my dearest friends, uh, now with the Lord, uh, loved this passage, and I hadn't known him a year when he said, by the way, um, this is one of the passages you're going to have to read at my funeral. Um, that was I was you know young and dumb and and uh, fortunately God was gracious. It was many years before I had to read this passage at my funeral, but I'd thought about it a lot between the time he told me that and, and the time I did his funeral. All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. It starts out pretty encouraging, right? Uh, kind of a nice image. Verdant green, flowers blooming, it's life, it's vital. No, not really. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. And I'm thinking, this is what Jack once read at his funeral? I mean, it's true, and it will have happened at that point, that essentially uh, the grass will have withered and the flowers fall. Surely the people are grass. This is what he once said at his funeral. And it's not because of that. It's certainly a good reminder of our frailty. Uh, the temporary nature of these bodies, not resurrection bodies yet, uh, not bodies that will last forever. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. That's why he wanted that read at his funeral. That's why it was so powerful to him, knowing that on our own we are mortal, we are temporary, we are frail, we are broken, but the word of God stands forever. And a lot can be loaded into that. 
Part of the word of our God stands forever follows on the for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. One of the things that God's people have always assumed that this means, the word of our God stands forever or the mouth of the Lord has spoken, is that whatever God says is true and whatever promises God makes, God will keep. And many, many, many of them God has already kept. And what does the New Testament tell us? All the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. That's an incredible promise. The word of God is faithful. God's promises are true. So for a people in exile, if God promises to bring them back, you can count on it. And God does. For a people who are dead in sin, lost and separated from God, the glory of the Lord is revealed when God brings them from death into life, from captivity into freedom, through the person and work of his son Jesus Christ, that is God's promise, that we will be new creatures, new creations if we are in Christ. God's promises are true. God also promises that Jesus is coming again. He will come back as King of kings, Lord of lords, unmistakably the whole world will see. And even though Peter says, expect people to scoff about that, they're not going to really think that it's going to happen. God's word stands forever. And finally for us, because we've been working our way through the Gospel of John, John begins with, in the beginning was the Word, the Word of God. Not just the words that God has spoken, not just the words written in the Bible, but now the living Word of God, Jesus Christ, appears, and He does stand forever. Eternal, immortal, almighty God in the person of Jesus Christ. So as we make our way through Advent... Remember, this is a time of preparation. That's, that's, I think, what your bulletin says on the front. It's a time of preparation. And the temptation is always just to make sure we're really good and ready for Christmas. And I want you to be. Because I'm hoping to be really good and ready for Christmas on a Sunday. Um, Hopefully, we'll be completely ready for Christmas Eve and for Christmas Sunday by Thursday the week before so that I can actually do Christmas too. I don't know what that Sunday is going to look like yet. But many of you already know I'm very excited about it. Very excited about it. I want to celebrate Christmas appropriately. That's not all the preparation we have to do. We are also those who are called to prepare for a second coming. For the King of kings and Lord of lords to show up for the glory of the Lord to be revealed in such a way that all the world will know that in Jesus Christ there is life and there is love and there is the living God. Behold, not only the Lamb of God, but behold the Lion of Judah, uh, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So we have good news Good news to proclaim to the world, and that's part of Advent as well. The world is looking at Christmas completely differently than the way that we're trying to. We are celebrating the birth and the arrival of the Word of God made flesh, but also getting ready for Him to come again. You who bring good tidings, that just means good news, which is, by the way, the translation of gospel. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John are gospels, but all that really means in Greek is good news or good tidings. And evangelist. If I say that word, you're going to have a whole bunch of images pop into your mind. Some might be pleasant, some unpleasant. If I said televangelist, there would be more unpleasant than pleasant. But all an evangelist is, is somebody who has good news. We worry so much. Are we called to be evangelists ourselves, talking to people we know about Jesus? Yes, we are. Uh, We worry about that, but all we are supposed to do is say, we've got good news. Do you want to hear some good news? You who bring good news, good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. That's Advent for you. Here is your God. A babe laid in a manger in Bethlehem, wonder of wonders and hard to believe that the Lord of the universe would fit in this manger in Bethlehem. But that's what our message is for Christmas. Here is your God in the person of Jesus Christ. And our goal, our task for Advent, is to prepare for him to come not in an an easily mistaken way. That's the irony of the glory of the Lord will be revealed, right? If you think back on that night in Bethlehem, you have two young parents who were utterly overwhelmed. Having gone through that now, I, I, I can sense their overwhelmedness. I just made up a word, but I can sense they're being really overwhelmed. Here they are. They're not even in a proper place to stay. They're not even necessarily staying with people they know, although we can quibble about that some other time. But here they are. And then this child comes into the world, this surprise child in some ways. The angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, this will be the Son of God. And Mary, to her great credit, says, 
Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. We talked about that in Sunday school today. Amazing that Mary can say that. But while they're dealing with their exhaustion and uh, the excitement and the being a new parent, these shepherds show up. These shepherds show up and they are also claiming that this is the Son of God. And they know it because angels showed up and the glory of the Lord, right, shone around them. One of the only times I really, really want the King James. And they were sore afraid. Not that we ever use that phrase except for the poor shepherds. Scared to death. But the glory of the Lord was revealed to the shepherds. They come to Mary and Joseph and they say, The angels told us this is the Son of God who will save the world from its sins. The Magi show up as well, bowing down and worshiping. But still, that's not glory being revealed so that all people together, all flesh, shall see it together. And that's why Advent is preparing us for a time when unmistakably, worldwide, utterly convincing, the majesty, glory, and power of God shows up in Jesus Christ. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. Here is your God, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. That's supposed to be comfort to God's children, by the way. On the day of the Lord, which all the Old Testament prophets show as a dark and terrible and frightening day, not all, because Isaiah says he comes with his reward and his recompense. All the blessings of God are coming when God shows up here, and he's coming with power. And lest we be terrified which is not a bad response, by the way. When Jesus shows up, it's okay to fall down on your face. Most of us will be that way anyway. But lest we be terrified by the sovereign Lord coming in power, Isaiah says this, he tends his flock like a shepherd and he gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart and gently leads those that have young. Sovereign, almighty God is the good shepherd of his sheep. Now, all through the Bible, we're told that we are God's people, the sheep of his pasture. Jesus shows up and says, I am the good shepherd, and my sheep know me, they know my voice, and I know my sheep. This is the message we have to say to the world. Here is your God, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed unmistakably worldwide in all of God's power. Well, for Isaiah's first people, uh, our first audience who were hearing this, they were hearing a word of hope. They were going off into exile, and they were told that there would be comfort coming and that God himself would deliver them and bring them back by his power and be with them. For the time uh, of Jesus and John the Baptist, the people still occupied were given a different word. The kingdom of God is at hand, and here is your God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, says John, in the wilderness on purpose so that he could be the voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. 2,000 years down the road, still the word comes to us. Whether we realize it or not, we also once were exiles. We also once were captives, enslaved by sin and death. But even though we've been freed from that, still if we find ourselves in a dark place, in a difficult place, still the word of God comes to us. Comfort, comfort my people. Be comforted, O my people. For God is coming with all power and with all love. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Will you please join me in prayer? Merciful God, we pray that you would reveal enough of your glory to us that whatever struggles we may be facing, we may still see your power and may still know your love. Almighty God, against whom no force can stand, is also the shepherd who gathers his lambs in his arms. Help us to trust in you, to find our peace and rest in you. Help us to rejoice in you. And then, overwhelmed by gratitude, Help us to say to the world, here is your God, in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.